<laughs> Hello. <laughs> Hi guys, it's been a while and this is kind of be like a different type of video than I usually post on here, but <laughs> you tend that airplanes in the night sky no. are like shooting stars. No. It started with a B. Oh, um Bob? <laughs> B-O-B? B-O-B, Bob. That's what I said, Bob. Love it in Bob. Anyway, so this is going to be a little bit of a different type of video just because of everything that has been going on socially, especially here in America. And there's just a lot of things that Melanie and I have been talking about. And I thought it would be, I don't know, like productive if we talked about it with you. Before we get started though with the queer talk, I did want to just say that I have posted some links down below in the description box. They are all related to the social justice movement that we've got going on right now. And I personally have been trying to educate myself because we both live in Alabama and we both grew up in Alabama and uh, it's, a, it's a very like racially, Controversial, tense. tense climate. I think for me, the most important thing as a white person is to figure out anything I can do in terms of taking action. I'll speak for myself as a white person. I definitely need to be more willing to face that from oh, right. my family members. Everyone else in my life is very open, but family, racist, homophobic. Mm -hmm. That's common where we live. Like Melanie was saying, I have been trying to take resources like podcasts and books to educate myself and being bold enough to speak out and also being educated enough to say the thing that is right. I will link that down below for you if you're interested and I'll also link some websites where you can go and donate for the Black Lives Matter movement. So getting into the topic of today's video and also so this is Melanie. Hello. She just <laughs> told me where to look. I know. We were like cutting and I was like, okay, make sure you look over here because this is this is where the Which, people are. That's I'm a millennial, I know this. But at the same time, I was following your lead. I know, I never look at the camera. You, I'm terrible. I'm always looking at myself. T. This is Melanie. Hello. I've got hair. Hi, hello. Hi, hello. <laughs> she is my girlfriend, my partner, my SO, my lady. This one's for the ladies. A lot of roles to fulfill. She's got a lot of hats around here. She's also, we had an, a small ant, a small, we had an ant problem this morning. Ant killer. And All I, that to <laughs> she was a great, which I usually don't kill bugs. Like before today, I had been like putting them in a little cup and taking them outside. But today, ant hoarder, I couldn't, I couldn't do that. So Melanie, why don't you <laughs> tell the people what you do for a living? And, um, yeah, we'll get, we'll get this ball rolling. I'm a therapist <laughs> for mental health. For the a licensed mind. counselor. A licensed. An LP. LPC. C. <laughs> you, you dabble in just about anything with mental health. Yeah. And she also helps me. She is my living therapist. <laughs> we are going to actually stretch this series. <laughs> it's a series if you didn't know. We are going to make this into a couple videos. Basically, we're just going to be talking about growing up queer, coming out queer, living life out, and how that affects your mental health and your relationships. In this first video, we're going to be talking about growing up queer. So we're gonna be starting at the beginning, honey. <laughs> I will say that if you follow me on Instagram, I asked you guys on there to just send in any questions regarding growing up queer. Either They could be a question for us personally, they could be a general question, and you guys sent some questions. So throughout the video, we will be answering some of those. And if you don't follow me on Instagram, then you should. And also don't forget to hit the subscribe button, right? 
They need to yep, subscribe. They need right. to hit the bell. Yeah, see, she bell. knows about the bell. Hit the bell. <laughs> like the video if you'd like. Leave us a comment. The record. First, just starting out, I think it would be important for us to talk about kind of where we grew up <laughs> and just kind of go from there. And we both are from Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I know, oh, actually, we're not. <laughs> <laughs> How long have we been dating? I'm from Birmingham, Alabama. She is not. I think what's so interesting about our parallel is that while we're both from Southern, you know, places, I've always lived in like suburbia and um, more of the city aspect of mm -hmm. Alabama. There was always a lot of people around. I went to school with a bunch of kids. My graduating class had like 700 children. Little bebops. As opposed to where you grew up. Yeah, it was, I would say on a farm. Yeah, small town, North Alabama, very rural. Rural. <laughs> no. <laughs> it's a, actually really pretty out there. Oh, it's gorgeous. It's you know, most places like that are gorgeous until you like need to go to Target and you're like, hmm. Yeah. For a point of reference, tell people Huntsville. When did you know that you maybe didn't like boys or your sexuality was a little different than maybe what was around. So yeah. my, I guess, realizations didn't come until I was about 14 or 15. So that's older. Um, when I would call it a realization, prior to that, I never really felt mm -hmm. like the other kids around me. She's an old soul. <laughs> I, I never really felt similar, especially to the other girls around me. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I, I think mostly in late elementary school, early middle school, the differences manifested a lot then. Well, this was second grade, but I remember being at my next door neighbor slash best friend's house mm -hmm. for her birthday and it was a pool party and there were girls there that I didn't know. I had short hair at the time, mm -hmm. so there was one girl in particular at this pool party who was like, only girls can be here. And I just remember being like, oh, am I that different? Like, mm -hmm. I, I mean, it's okay. Like I, <laughs> <laughs> some of these stories I, mean, I know, I but it. some of them I don't. So I'm like, hmm. it, that's just a small example of why I never really fully felt like I fit in with Well, and I also think girls. that the girls that you would have probably been attracted to at that time, you didn't really, you weren't surrounded by a lot of them, you know? No, and I never, so that's a good point, is when did I realize that I was different is a different time than when I realized that I was attracted to females. Okay. Because even, I think one of the questions that you got was um, mm. first Your celebrity first crush. crushes. Yeah. <laughs> I love so, that question. So that, that was Liz. Thanks, that's Liz. interesting too. My first, what I now would call a celebrity crush was when, do you remember when Kelly Clarkson was on the first season of American Idol? I really liked her. I love Kelly Clarkson. And so at the yes. time, even at the time though, I wouldn't have said, Ooh, I really have a crush Mom, on her, but I was drawn things. to her, you know? Uh, and that finale when she's okay so uh, anyway from Justin to Kelly okay so yeah. she was like your first like well like, hmm. she that was around the time and I was like what 11 12 13 yeah. something like that mm -hmm. um before that I thought that my crush was <laughs> Leo DiCaprio oh yeah because let me just mm -hmm. take a second Titanic just, that's right? my favorite movie it's her favorite yes. she's not like I, when she told me Titanic was her favorite movie, I said, She laughed. What? She thought it was funny. No. <laughs> Leonardo. He was yeah, I, th jam. I would have said that when I was younger, but now it's more of like I wanted to be him kind mm -hmm. of thing. And Kate Winslet for sure was like Hardcore a little crush. crush on her. Yeah. But that's, that's what's interesting to me is even at the time, I didn't realize that I was trying to fit in a little bit more. And mm -hmm. so I would have said things like that, like, ooh, Leo DiCaprio, blah, blah, blah. Right. Or I would have talked about boys that were in my class that I thought were cute, mm -hmm. and I really didn't. I just kind of felt weird later on into my early teenage years. That's when I first started realizing, like, wait a minute this is why this is when you get excited about talking all about these revelations <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah and so i guess it's 
interesting because hers happened a little older. For some people, those attractions definitely start at a little bit of a younger age. Mm -hmm. For myself, I remember mine, mine were really early on. Uh, for sure and I told Melanie this like not long after we met but I remember it was always really interesting that when I was I would say even like five five or six I would start you know that's usually when you start having dreams about hand holding and cuddling I didn't have a lot of dreams about like kissing and things like that just because you know at that age my mind wasn't quite there mm -hmm. but I remember um, when I started having dreams and I knew I was being kind of like romantic with someone it it was always a female like I never had a dream about a, a guy and I remember every time I would wake up I would feel because in the dream I would it would feel totally normal like I you know mm -hmm not a big deal it would feel like just natural to me and then i'd wake up and i'd be so confused because i was homeschooled until i was in 11th grade and my family we grew in a very structured religious bubble and so i didn't have like queer influences from anywhere we didn't have we had three channels until i was a teenager so i didn't i not even tv i, I had nothing to go on mm -hmm. and so that kind of progressed and as i got into the eight to ten like pre-teenage it started being like where i was kissing girls in my dreams and things like that and even despite all of those things because i'm in such denial of myself <laughs> I still lived my life like thinking that I just liked guys and it wasn't until I was 13 and my for those of you who don't know my parents started ministry when I was four so my dad started pastoring when I was around four and I so I don't have any memory of my parents not being very very religious having to like put on that show of what being a pastor and a pastor's daughter means. I, I, I just kind of lived my life and it wasn't until I was 13 that I, we actually, we had a youth group at church and obviously kids that come to the youth group were in public schools and they were more edgy. <laughs> they were experienced, okay? And there was this one girl who um, had, she was bi. And I remember, um, my friends telling me that she went, you know, around the halls of her school and said that she was bi. And at first I was like, what that mean? <laughs> so when they told me that, yeah, she's, she kisses girls sometimes and she also dates guys and she like was attracted to girls too. It wasn't just like <laughs> for the boys, you know? And yeah, she, she and I messaged on Facebook for a little while. I'm sorry, MySpace for a little while. And I remember having a crush on her, but anytime I would start to feel myself creeping in romantically in that way, I would instantly, it's like that inner religious part of me that was like, oh, no girl. So yeah, and my first crush, okay, so my first crush crush was probably, oh, it was definitely like Nick Jonas, probably. <laughs> Like low key used to pray almost every night that I would marry him. Oh, before that it was Justin Timberlake. I had this in sync poster in my room and I would literally kiss it every morning when I woke up. And one day my mom walked in the room and noticed that the poster had 14 holes in at the top of it where I had kissed him so passionately at eight years old <laughs> that I like pulled down the poster. <laughs> so I would have to rehang it. And my mom was like, what are those holes in your poster? I was like, I don't know. <laughs> so Oops. that that was my first crush, but my first female crush where I knew like, I'm not like straight was definitely Haley Williams and Paramore. Oh, for sure. I had a boyfriend at the time who was obsessed with her. And so I originally only started watching her videos so that I could see what she looked like to see if like I, I could like mimic her in any Dang. way. <laughs> and I watched her videos and instead of trying to mimic her, I was like, hmm, she's really cool. <laughs> I really like her. So that was definitely my first crush. Speaking of NSYNC, so... <laughs> Britney Spears and Ricky Martin were oh, right. big at the time uh -huh. NSYNC was. So what's funny is you ask me now 
like early celebrity crushes, Britney Spears, 100%. Sometimes video, yeah. the vi like the video for sometimes. Oh, sometimes. She's I super can. tan. Like, I also <laughs> wish I had that tan, but yeah. that was a hardcore crush for me at the time. Aww. I wouldn't have said that or thought that because it yeah. wasn't necessarily sexual. Like, right, um, right. I think that's, a, that's important. Yeah. Because I think where, like, I don't want to say my family, but where a lot of people would try to contradict me and my feelings at a young age is, okay, you think this girl is nice looking, but like, do you want to have sex with her? And, and that was so me, like at eight and 12 and like 13 and 14, I, I wasn't thinking of anyone in a sexual way like that. I think that a lot of the times is where as a kid, I would say, no, I'm not gay because I don't like think about kissing this person. Right. I just think she's really pretty. Yeah. And so, yeah. Yeah, I was just, I guess, again, the best way I can describe it is it's just a feeling like you're drawn towards you're drawn, somebody yeah. and they happen to be the same sex. Yeah. Ricky Martin, though, I would have told you at the time was my crush and now it's like, that's I'm, funny because he's Ricky gay Martin. and he came yeah. out as gay. Yeah. So that's just like... <laughs> I remember when he came out, my mom was like, but my mom, my mom was upset. Was like, your mom upset too? Yeah. Middle-aged women. Sorry, mom. Middle-aged straight women. Yeah. I want to talk a little bit about where religion and sexuality kind of met for us at a young age. Mm -hmm. um, both growing up in Alabama, you know, you're usually going to be Southern. If you're white, usually. You're going to be like Southern Baptist or like non-denominational like those are the two mains then you also have like presbyterian methodist um nazarene there's not that many nazarenes <laughs> that i've met but usually it's like southern baptists are non-denominational and then sometimes you'll get like a methodist or like yeah mm -hmm. presbyterian but melanie like most white women grew up southern baptist mm -hmm. how did religion and sexuality correlate for you god that's a loaded question mm -hmm. um that's probably been the hardest thing in my life to date that I have dealt with. And I, I mean, I still see myself as being on that journey just because it's, um, spirituality is like never ending. sometimes. Yes, for sure. Spirituality, mm -hmm. you continue growing in it, expanding in that, but even just articulating my really? journey so far is difficult sometimes because I always want to make sure I have the, the best words to say that that people can hear and not shut out because that's True. what I experienced a lot. Right. Mostly just, again, from family members. I spent a good six years trying to navigate my religious upbringing and what that meant for my realization that I was attracted to the same sex mm -hmm. and wanted to be with the same sex in a relationship that was not just a friendship. Mm -hmm. Spirituality to me is different than religion. Religion's kind oh, of yeah. a, you know, a carry. Or, it's like a border that we box spirituality with. It can be. It was a good six years of mm -hmm. trying to go through that stuff, trying to just figure out where I stood. And now I'm in the part of the journey where I'm trying to figure out how to communicate that with other people. Other people. Yeah. And it was important for me to do a lot of research um, into specific Bible passages and what biblical scholars have said about certain things that mm -hmm. at least the Southern Baptist Church considers, you know, concrete Word of God. Going through that, expanding my perspective using research, using what other people have looked into, and this includes scholars who both identify as Christian and who don't. So I got mm -hmm. kind of all perspectives, view. which is what I wanted because I wanted right. to take that, what I learned, because to me, things that you can research and educate yourself on, especially when it comes to translations, what was going on culturally at the time, right. why were certain things worded, what do we know, what don't we know. What got you to like a place of peace with it where mm -hmm. you were like, I'm, I, I'm good mm -hmm. here? There was no one experience, but it, it was, it was peace that was gained over time, but there was a specific about two week period of time when I was in college that I point to as kind of a pivotal moment where I finally let go of 
a lot of the, you know, shame and self-hatred and um, guilt, immense guilt for, I mean, there was a, a point in my journey where mm -hmm. I really thought that it was a sin, um, not just to be in a relationship and to show your sexuality through actions like being in a relationship, but to have the attraction to the same all. sex. Yeah, yeah. It, that's what I felt was a it's, sin. It's because, like, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he, and we're taught, you know. Yeah, so I, I mean, that was devastating, and I was hurt by that whole process. I was hurt by my own internalized homophobia. Am I religious? I would say no. Am I spiritual? Yes. But to me, what's most important is how do you experience the connection with your higher power? Bigger picture, Relational things. you know, it's what gives you meaning, purpose, sense of connection, that kind of thing. And I think like you helped me a lot when even like when we met, just because my, um, my journey with it definitely was layered. I can feel my voice getting nervous. Not really nervous, but it, it's like, it's an emotional thing for me just because of how I grew up and how spirituality affected my whole being, like my whole life. I, like I said, my parents were pastors at, I was around four. And so from then on, all of my memories are with the church and the church that I was raised in, um, it, ultimately, we claimed non-denominational, but my dad went to a Word of Faith Bible College is what it was called, and I, it's not accredited college. It's like a Bible school, I guess you could say, but the Word of Faith Church is the banner of that, and um, when I talk to people about that, a lot of people are like, what is Word of Faith, and it's, it's really at a very evangelical and um, I guess it's like if you took an evangelical church mixed with like a little Pentecostal because we love the Holy Spirit and there's a lot of like spiritual gifts that are always moving. It's kind of like a, a hybrid of that. While that the church that I grew up grew up in was very structured, it was also a very spiritual experience. And so for my whole life, I have always been like just a very touchy feely, emotional, feelings driven at most of my life um, type of person. <laughs> so growing up in a very heavy spiritual home, I think I just clung to all of those things. I think it's, the experience is a little bit different for anyone whose family is, is a spearhead of a, a ministry because there is a, an, a, a large amount of pressure as to like how you appear at all times. And I think that was the main um, insecurity that I took with me for so much of my life was like, you know, my dad is a pastor and I can even remember going in to church services on Sunday as the pastor's daughter, feeling like I, I put on that hat and I my whole demeanor would change. Like I would um, be very polished, I'd be very poised. Like I would talk to people like I was in a political campaign. I remember going into it thinking, okay, I'm a pastor's daughter now. Even my own personality was different. I, I think, which in turn, like a lot of people tended to think that I was like a stuffy person, I think some of the time. And it, I, I, it wasn't that at all, it was just, there was such a pressure. Like I remember my, my parents all the time, their quote was, we live in a glass house, we live in a glass house. And it's like, I remember if you th take things like drinking, like a lot of religions, I know a lot of Southern Baptists are taught, like it's, it, it's a sin to drink in general. But for me, it was, no, it's not a sin to drink, it's a sin to get drunk. But if you're out in public and you're drinking, and even though you're not getting drunk, if someone else sees you drinking, then it could cause them to stumble. And it would go back to the passage, you know, like, don't let your actions cause your neighbor to like stumble. And I remember in that moment being like, so it's fine what we do in private, but when we're out in front of everybody, we just have to keep it chill. You know, and I feel like that's kind of the tone for a lot of people in the church. There's a lot of stuff that goes down privately, but on the outside, it's like, no, 
it's great. We're fine. It, we're, we're great. And so I think that was the struggle for me. It was like, okay, so I just really have to control what everyone else sees about me. That was a big barrier with my being queer and having a really, a, a lot of pressure spiritually growing up was like, okay, I, I'm not only concerned with how I see myself, but I'm concerned with like how all of these people see me. I truly know though that like the saving grace for me was um, growing up, I I was always taught of who God was, but I, I being like a very relational person, I, I truly talked to my higher power almost every day. Like I would tell God good morning and I would tell him good night and I would talk to him all throughout the day. And like my relationship with, with my spirituality was always very tight knit. And I think I have so many like very um, vivid memories of times in my life where I was truly struggling with, okay, like who am I really? And who is everyone else seeing? Any time that I would second guess myself or shame myself for the feelings that I was having, I was always taught that, well, it's your, it's God who will let you know that things are wrong. Like you'll tell that they're wrong on the inside. And it, when it came to my attraction to women and my wanting to love and be in a relationship, I would go back to God and go back to God and go back to God about it. And I never felt a negative thing from him ever. And I remember just like having conversation after conversation and just thinking the only condemnation is a word that is thrown around a lot, but the only condemnation that I felt was from other people. Like I never felt that from my spiritual life. That is the main thing that we talked about for me. I think it's dangerous when you have to rely on a religion to tell you what your beliefs are and, and what is morally good. I feel like you should know in your heart and in your core, you know, what is what is a just thing and, and what isn't. And for me, it was feeling really uncomfortable at the fact that we had to have all of these sets of rules to know what our opinion was on something. and. I think that was like the breakdown for me was like, you know, I, I know who the God that I've always served is and I, I know how that relationship makes me feel and I, I can't go off of, a, of these other people anymore. That's kind of like how I came to it and I'm still coming to it. I, I was talking about it the other day that I always refer to God as he when I'm talking about him because we're always, you know, in Christianity, we're taught, you know, he's, he, he, he's kind of like on a throne and you picture like this white beard. It's recently <laughs> that I'm like, what did you picture? Just clean, clean, clean shave, Mr. Yeah. Clean, yeah. <laughs> Mr. Yeah. Clean on no, the throne. No, 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 no. <laughs> and so I think it's just been in the last few years that I've really been, um, you know, kind of breaking down all of those barriers within myself. God doesn't have a gender. <laughs> I, I, I just look at that source as a light in my life and an encouragement when I need it. It helps me every day. <laughs> I've been really bad about um, referencing questions as we're going through this video, but most of the topics that we've discussed were like questions. So there was a question about when did you know that you were queer and we answered that. And what was the other question? How did you go about living shame free? And so that to me is like uh, how we interpreted mm -hmm. religion and spirituality. Shame in general. I guess this is where my therapist mode will come in a little bit. Shame is one of the most difficult states of being that any human can go through. Find a therapist or at least find a way to process mental health, improve mental health. Read some Brene Brown. Yes, she... listen to some Lizzo. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you can yeah. feel yourself, you know? Yes. I, 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 I think I love being in, in like a serious situation. I love to talk about my feelings in a serious way. Like mm -hmm. I, poor Melanie, she has to deal with it every single day. <laughs> but I, I also feel like you need a little silly in your life. Like, especially in times like this, if it's even just to take like a 10 minute break to like blare some music and like jam out and like really feel yourself, you need that. Then another person asked, what was it like growing up being a pastor's kid? Because they, they knew me personally. And I talked a little bit about that as well. 
The last question that we are going to talk about in this growing up queer video is we had someone ask, we had a couple people actually ask how to be a good ally in the LGBTQ community. For me, I feel like um, I really have to go within myself to answer these types of questions because I am, for any of those out there who are Enneagram fans, which is I think most people, I am, I'm an Enneagram stan. I literally, I, I think, I just, I live and breathe Enneagram. I'm kind of a nerd, but I'm a two. And so I'm like the people pleaser. Like I just want everybody to be cool. I want you to be okay. I want you to be okay. I want you to be okay. And so when people ask like, what can I do to make sure you're okay? I'm kind of like, me? Does not compute. Does it? I'm like, okay, let me sit here and think about that for a second. And I think honestly for me, and we haven't really gone into our labels. I, I know for us both personally, it's, I, and I also think it's a millennial, you know, generational thing for us that it's not so fun to label yourself. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've never, I've not really met a, a, a lot of queer people that are our age that love saying, I'm this. Like, and it's not that we're not proud, but it's like, I just don't like to put myself in a box. It's a very millennial of me. I consider myself to be pansexual just because I don't see your body as far as like your genitalia when I'm first attracted to you. Like I'm attracted to the way someone walks, the way they talk, their energy, their personality. I don't look at the makeup. And then Melanie, so I like the term queer because it's simple and to me that's what my sexuality is. So with that to say like I am a pansexual woman and I like really have to think about <laughs> what you can do to like help me and to me it's it is it's a very simple as far as being a good ally I think that if you are just looking at me like I'm a person the same as you and treating me the same that you would treat a heterosexual person. I think I, at the end of the day, I just don't want to feel like I'm ostracized or like I don't want to feel like I'm so different, you know? What I really admire most about a lot of our friendships is most of our friends are heterosexual. Like we were in heterosexual relationships. And what I love is that Melanie and I can be at a table for for dinner with our friends who are heterosexuals and we all feel equal to each other. We mm -hmm. all feel like we are the same. And I think that is my my biggest want. And everybody's wants are gonna be different. So there's no right or wrong. But for mm -hmm. me, it's just treat everybody with love and respect and don't ostracize anyone for who they choose to be with for their life or for their next five minutes. And when there's a time to speak up for people. Like I'm, I'm always about speaking up, especially right now we have those talks about like addressing things with family that when they make ignorant statements, speak up about that mm -hmm. stuff. Like that yeah. means the world to me as a queer woman, but also, you know, right now with the social justice movement, I feel like that's gonna mean the world. And so, yeah, yeah, those are the main things for me. What yeah. for you? I was also gonna say probably the, the most impactful practical thing that I would want my ally to do is just have more conversations with the people in your life right. um, like Jillian said speak up if something ignorant or mm -hmm. misguided is said one of the reasons that we and other people in the queer community are able to articulate what we think about all this is because we have had to think about it right. every day so think about it more often. I think that was a, a conversation we had a lot because I'm, I'm always someone who tries to have empathy for the other side. And I am someone that even if I identified as straight, I know that I would still take the time to educate myself just because I care about people. And I, 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 I hate to see when people are mistreated, but sometimes that doesn't come as naturally to everyone. And so I we've had discussions about like, 
we get that if you're not dealing with this firsthand, it's like it's not always going to be at the forefront of your mind. But maybe there just could be certain points where you do think about it, you know, and, and you do try to educate yourself on things. And mm -hmm. yeah, I think that that goes a long way. Because to me, I really admire someone who doesn't experience something firsthand, but can educate themselves to have empathy and mm -hmm. support for another person. Mm -hmm. um, that's humanity. <laughs> yeah. Especially for our friend Leah, she has talked a good bit even recently about her own journey navigating what she believes mm -hmm. and what she has seen in my life. Just I've known her mm -hmm. for several years and yeah, Jeez. it was so sweet. We asked her like on her journey, like because I I I just tend to be a little more upfront with once I'm you know comfortable with people, and knowing how religious Leah is, I asked her how did you come to being okay with like Melanie, and then with Melanie and I like with Melanie dating, and. It, her response was so sweet. It, yeah, she it was, was like, sweet. I was I saw you guys together and how pure you were and how it's not different. Yeah, she was like, and I realized it it's wasn't like, different. And I was like, that was the yeah. reason. Such a two <laughs> thing. Yes, Jillian. <laughs> it's just me. Yeah. no, but simplify it. Are we any different than you? You being, if you're in heterosexual, hetero. or if you don't identify someone in the queer community, just ask yourself like do you really think that we're that different i hope that we got some good clarity mm -hmm. in this first video i i know when i'm editing I'm, I'm going to like be less hard on myself but i feel like i've been so like i just want to say what i need to say and you know also i'm so proud mm -hmm. of melanie this is her first time ever doing anything like this and she's doing so good thank y'all so much for watching the first part of this queer series that we have on my youtube channel we will be talking about coming out in the next video if you have any questions for us on coming out because we have some coming out stories y'all some more details yes we have some deets some stories some times some relationships some struggle some ups some downs <laughs> If you have any specific questions for us or general questions on coming out, please let us know in the comments below. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you. <laughs> have a great day. Bye. Bye. You'll be my safety. We 